you're getting ready to hear a message from one of our Sunday experiences at Hope Church. But before you do that, click the subscribe button. That way, you can stay up to date with all of our content and every video that we drop each week. Enjoy the message. Go to your Bibles of 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. And uh, I'm going to read a few verses and then paraphrase a few. 1 Kings 18, that comes before 2 Kings. 1 Kings does. Preacher jokes, just don't worry about it. 1 Kings 18. Verse 20, we'll start there. <laughs> so Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. So Ahab is a king here uh, over God's people. Um, and Elijah is an Old Testament prophet, one of the most famous, notorious prophets of the Old Testament. Verse 22, then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left as a prophet to the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. You call on the name of your gods I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal, this pagan god, from morning till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them. Elijah starts talking some junk. He said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey somewhere. Perhaps he's sleeping, and that's what you got to do. Shout louder. He might awake if you shout louder. So they cried aloud, and then they cut themselves, as was their custom. They cut themselves with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and what did he do? He repaired the altar. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the 12 stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seas of seed. Watch this. And he put wood in order, and he cut the bull in pieces, and he laid it on the wood, and he said, fill four water pots with water. That'll mean something to you in a minute. And pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. They did it. Then he said, do it a third time. And they did it. So the water ran all around the altar and also filled the trench. And it came to pass at the time of the offering, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, what they do? They said and fell on their faces, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and he executed them there. Elijah's a bad dude. You don't want to mess with Elijah. I thought about calling this message, Cut the Bull.
because I just get tired of, never mind, dealing with bull. Some of y'all mad already. I was like, okay, pastor, this. But this message, I believe, is an on point on time for God's church, for this church. And I want to talk about the day the fire fell. The day the fire fell. Father, open up our ears to hear your word. Make us ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. I know Mama Liz is going to remember the day the fire happened at her house. But I've learned that God still can keep things even in ashes. That even in ashes, God still has things that he is able to keep. The day the fire fell with Elijah was a day of separation. It was a day of getting God's people's attention again, getting their attention again. And preparing for this message, I I wholeheartedly believe that today's going to be a day that the fire of God's presence falls on some people's lives. I really believe that. I believe that there's going to be an awakening in some people. I believe there's going to be uh, a, a rousing, if you will, from spiritual sleep, from from uh, maybe a, a complacency or a hesitancy or, or this idle way of living and approach to who God is. And so I believe in this point in time in history that more than ever that the church of God, the people of God, have to be a people who are a people who are an on-fire people. They have to be a people that... that that in this series we're talking about the altar, they have to be a people like Abraham who know how to to sacrifice. And last week we talked about that every day requires another yes to God. Every day requires another yes. I got to give God another yes. If God is a covenant God, which he is, he requires another yes to his covenant living day after day. And it's your choice. He won't force you to live according to his covenant. That's why, that's why, um, When we love him and when we worship him, it's coming from a place of true worship because if God forced us to worship him, he would not be a loving God. And so people want to know why there's evil in the world and why bad things happen. It's because God had to give mankind choice. He had to give mankind the power to decide because he had to give us, uh, he, he had to be true love from us back to him. Because if he forced us to love him, it would not be true worship. And so he had to give us something called choice to, to make us and allow us to choose to worship him. Because when we forsook and, and let go of all worldly things and we begin to choose to love him and live for him, then that is true, powerful love towards God. Are you, are you hearing me? And so when evil things arise and when bad things happen, it's because there is evil and sin in the world and people are not choosing to live according to God's covenant life. Instead, they're choosing a wicked life. And so that's why these evil things arise and why the earth is groaning, the Bible says, according to Romans. It's because sin is in the world and it's because man chose incorrectly way back in Genesis. You with me? Okay, that's just the appetite that I wasn't even a part of it, but let me get into uh, the day the fire fell. Elijah is on top of Mount Carmel, and, and so the people of Israel, the people of Israel, they are actually uh, people who, in a sense, to put it in a statement, they want their cake and eat it too. They, 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 they want to live the way they want to live, but still say that they're God's people. They are under a king named Ahab, and the Bible says that under King Ahab that he did wicked in the eyes of the Lord. And since Ahab did wicked in the eyes of the Lord, so goes the king, so goes the people. And so the people started worshiping Baal while they were also worshiping God. Mm -hmm. You know how, you know, people, they're they're Christian, they got the label Christian. And you know what I'm I'm learning nowadays is that, that I can't... You can't always look to somebody who calls himself a Christian to get an example of Christianity. Are you feeling what I'm saying? 
and, and it's sad but true that, that everybody can slap the label Christian over their life, but you can't look to everybody's life who says they are that way in a Christian to get an example of what true Christ-like living should be. And the people of Israel, they are saying they're God's people, but their worship then, their worship has been divided. They're trying to worship Baal, who is believed by, by, by these people and by uh, those who worship him. He, they are, he is believed to be the God over the sky. The God over the sky. The God that, that rule and, and causes you know, rain to fall and, and, and the sun and all of those things. That's who Baal, this God Baal, they believe him to be. And so, so, <laughs> here's Elijah. And he comes to Ahab, and, and here comes Elijah towards Ahab, and Ahab greets him and says, what are you doing here, you troubler of Israel? Because anytime a true prophet steps into an atmosphere, the, the, the spiritual atmosphere has to be submitted to that, to that superior power. And here comes Elijah saying, uh, get all the people of Israel, and I want you to also get those prophets who eat from Jezebel's table." There's 850 in all, but 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Ashura, another pagan god. And he said, I want you to get all those prophets, and I want you to get all God's people, and I want you to meet me on top of this mountain. Ahab does it. They show up. Elijah opens up the scene with this statement, and he says in verse 21 to all the people, Elijah don't have a choir behind him. Elijah don't have a keyboardist. He don't have a great worship team. It is just him. It is him versus 850 pagan prophets plus his own people who he can't even trust to support him. I'm just trying to paint the picture for you. And he opens up his sermon with this question. How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, worship him. If Baal is God, then worship him. He's setting the scene because he knows what he is being led to do by the Spirit of God. He knows what's about to take place on top of this mountain. He knows that he serves a God who hears when he calls. And he opens up by saying, how long are you going to try to worship at the feet of someone else's altar but also try to worship at the altar of God. How long will you call yourself by my name but not live according to my will? How long will, are you going to be intimidated by the surrounding culture and the climate of society when I've already called you to stand out? I've already called you to be that city on a hill and to be different and to be light and darkness. And Elijah gives us this picture. He is a man of conviction. He is a man that follows God's word. He is a man that is all about God's presence. And he stands boldly. Picture yourself on top of a mountain and the scene is there. And you are deliberately challenging pagan prophets to a contest. You're pretty confident in what God can do. Just stay with me. And Elijah begins to to give out instruction. He said, here's what we're going to do. You're going to get your bull. You're going to give me one too. And we're going to cut it up. And you're going to put it on an altar. I'm going to put it on mine. And we're going to see whose God is the real one. That's it. And whoever answers by fire, that's the one. Elijah is actually playing into what these pagans believe. That, that if Baal is God, then surely he's the God of the sky. He can answer this way. And if my God is God, he'll answer by fire. But watch this. The first thing, the day the fire fell, here's what you got to do. If you want fire to fall in your life, which means the presence of God, which means the passion, which means, which means living on purpose, because I don't want you to mistake uh, living a life of on fire for God simply to mean just being excited all the time. Because there's going to be days you won't be excited all the time. And we can mistake that for, well, I must not be living in, with God's presence because I'm not excited. 
Do you understand how many men and women wanted to give up and, and wanted to quit? Uh, Elijah being one of them, he, after this particular scene, he wanted to die because he didn't feel like he was supported by his people. So there's going to be days you don't feel excitement. That's why we can't equate living uh, with the fire of God as simply excitement. Now, excitement can be a byproduct of living passionately for God, but it's not the only thing. Okay? And so, so if you want the fire to fall, though, if you want to be a person who, who lives intentionally, be a person who lays down their life sacrificially day after day, and be a person like Elijah, who the Bible says was just a man like you and I, but yet he, he said that it wouldn't rain and the, the heavens shut up. <laughs> and so if we are like Elijah... Or excuse me, if Elijah is just a man, then you and I can live on purpose in a way where God can use us in mighty ways just like he used Elijah. And so if you want the fire to fall, how many of you want the fire of God's presence to fall on your life? Somebody, you need fire in your marriage. Hello. You need fire in relationships. You need fire back in your calling and your purpose. And I believe, I sense that there's a great weariness on people in these days. There's a weariness on people that it's just a struggle just to get in the car to go to work. And it's just a struggle to talk about what you used to say you are passionate about. And I believe that today God wants to cause fire to fall back on your life to illuminate to illuminate a desire for his kingdom, illuminate a desire for time with him because your life cannot be lived on purpose until it's spent in God's presence. And Elijah has been in solitude up until this point. God, he proclaimed a drought three years earlier. That's a key detail. There has been a drought going on for three years. What does that mean? It hasn't rained. The land is dry. And then after he proclaims the drought, Elijah travels by himself to a brook where God takes care of him there. He feeds him with, by some ravens, right? Ravens drop off some happy meals for him. He, he, he allows him to get refreshed. And then he calls him to a widow's house. So, so he goes on these journeys, and he's all by himself. He's in solitude. But God is not just allowing him to experience loneliness. You see, we need to understand that we can actually convert loneliness into solitude. Did you hear what I just said? We can convert loneliness into solitude when we turn solitude into prayer. I can convert loneliness into solitude, which is intentional time with God, and turn it into prayer. I don't have to feel alone when I have God. And this is a hard, hard thing for some people to grasp because you can't see God. You can't, you can't feel or touch or see him tangibly, but, but, and, it, and it messes with your physical senses. But we have to understand God is spirit. The Bible says God is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so we have to understand that first and foremost. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. You can't see the wind, but you know the wind is real because it, how it blows trees, how it blows trash across a parking lot, you know the wind is real. And I know how my God is real. Just like Mama Liz said, I know my God is real because I've seen him do too many things. I haven't seen the physicality of God, but I've seen the result of God moving and the result of God working. But if we want the fire to fall, number one, you got to address any divided devotion. you got to address any divided devotion. Well, how long will you falter between two opinions? God is not interested in people who have a divided devotion, who, who, who are saved. You know, you saved, but you dabbling. Dabbling. What does he mean, dabbling? You know what I mean. You saved, but you like what you like. You saved, but 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 still like to. You still like that 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 prodigal son who likes to go to that pig pen every now and then. You're saved, but you still like to look at what you like to look at. You, you're saved, and you still like to drink what you like to drink. You're saved, but you still like to take what you like to take. You're saved, but you still like to go where you like to go. Come on now. Come on. 
And when you have divided devotion, ain't no fire going to fall on a life lived with a divided devotion. In fact, you can see in Revelation, Jesus says, I'd rather you be hot or I'd rather you be cold. But if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you. I'm going to spit you. I'm going to vomit you out my mouth. Because God is not a God who stays in the middle ground. And nor should those who follow him live in the middle ground. Well, today I got my life over here, my foot's in this, this way of living, and then tomorrow I'll put it back in this Christian way of living. But today I'm going to put on this. Tomorrow I'm going to be a Christian again. And we can't go back and forth. If you stay in the middle of the road, you get run over. God is not a God who, is, who, who tolerates mediocrity. He is not a God that tolerates average. He says, you're either going to be hot or you're going to be cold. And that's why he says, choose you this day. He gives you the power to choose, to decide who you're going to serve, which ultimately determ determines how I'm going to live. So who I serve and who I choose to serve ultimately determines how I'm going to live. Do I slip up and fall sometimes? Absolutely. Is it a daily fight? Is it a daily struggle? Absolutely. But once I've made my choice, I at least got a guide and a blueprint of how my life should be looked, how it should look, and how I should be living it. It tells me how I should treat other people. It tells me what to do with my money. It tells me uh, how to care for those who are in need. It tells me how I should worship God. It tells me I should be a part of a church community. When I get this God in my life, once I've made my decision, the problem is some of us are trying to operate with two different manuals. Jay, try to go put something together with one manual that has instructions for what you're putting together and another manual that's for another piece of furniture. Before too long, you can't look back and forth and say, well, this piece of furniture says it needs to go this. Well, you ain't building that piece. I have to choose. And I can't operate from two different manuals. Elijah says... There's too much divided devotion. You, you want to say you serve God, but your life is it's, it's, it's cold. It's lukewarm, rather. It's lukewarm. It's, it's stale. And today, he brings them to a point of decision. He brings them to a point of decision. God will always challenge you at a point of decision. The rich young ruler I mentioned earlier, Jesus brought him to a point of decision. When he walked by the sea, and saw some fishermen. He brought them to a point of decision and said, come follow me. At that moment, they had to decide. They had to decide, will I follow this rabbi, this Jewish rabbi, or will I continue to fish in my father's business? And they had to decide because purpose was moving. And they had to decide, were they going to join up with what God was doing? They had to decide because God will always bring you to a point of decision. He will not allow you to stay in the middle ground. Are you hearing me? You have to address any divided devotion. Where is there any divided devotion in your life? Where are you devoted half-heartedly to God? Where have you not allowed God to fully access that place in your life? Is it your habits? Is it that cycle of thinking? Maybe it's relationships. Where have you not allowed God to access that place? Hmm. Address any divided devotion. God is not interested in that. Elijah is bringing the people to this point. Uh, the next thing, write this down. Uh, you have to live, you have to live with deliberate dedication. You gotta, you gotta live with deliberate dedication. In verse 30, uh, after, watch this, after all the prophets of Baal, they're 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 shouting. Listen to this. Watch this. They're shouting. They call on the name of their God. They're leaping. Right? 
They're cutting themselves. And then they start prophesying. They're shouting. Then they start leaping. And then they start trying to do it out of their own flesh. And then they start trying to speak it into existence. Pay attention to the picture here because it's not just Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. This is a picture of what the modern day church is versus the church God wants. This is a picture because we can shout. Somebody give him a shout. That was your cue, Josh. You missed it. That was your cue. There we go. Okay. You're late, but you're worth waiting on. Here we go. They, they gave him a shout, and then, then what they do? They started leaping. You know why? And then they started, they started trying to figure out, well, maybe if we just prayed harder. Maybe if I just sang louder. Ha! Oh, maybe I'll just blab it and grab it. Name it, claim it. That sounds so familiar. Maybe I'll just keep trying harder and harder. But, I, but I, was, I was talking with someone this morning, and I told them, I said, sometimes I don't feel like praying. Oh, y'all, okay, don't look at me like y'all just holy. Like, I pray. I'm, I'm excited to pray every time. No, you're not. Okay, if you are, you're better than Peter, James, and John because they fell asleep, and the Son of God said, can y'all pray with me? Don't tell me you ain't going to have trouble praying. I was teaching our Hope Seminary class this past week. By the way, Hope Seminary, you need to sign up for it. Get a degree. I was teaching them that if prayer, if prayer wasn't powerful, why would you be fought so hard to do it? If prayer had no power, then why would you be fought so hard to do it? Sometimes I don't feel like praying. Sometimes I don't feel like worshiping. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm just, I'm just God... You know what's going on in me. I don't feel it. But then I, but then I remember <laughs> that, that, he's, that he's been too good. Then I remember he woke me up for a reason. And after I come out of my pity party, then I can start to remember, wait a minute, he deserves the praise whether I feel like it or not. And here come the prophets of Baal. They're shouting, they're, they're screaming, they're leaping, and they're cutting themselves. They're prophesying, but yet there is no answer. You know why? Because they're worshiping at the wrong altar. They're worshiping at the wrong altar, calling on the wrong God, thinking that they're going to get a response if they just... Exert more energy. <laughs> this is messing with some of y'all because we get excited. We, we're passionate people, and, and that we should be. But don't equate just an emotional response to the fact that the fire is falling on your life. Mm. It has to be a deliberate dedication it has to be deliberate dedication. It has to be a people whose devotion is not divided, but they actually are dedicated and they're deliberate in what they, how they dedicate to God. Because Elijah says in verse 30, he says, come near to me. And it says he repaired the altar, not of Baal. He repaired the altar of the Lord. And that's where I believe some of us are today. Some of us watching, you need to repair an altar back in your life. You need to repair an altar back in your life because there was at one point you would get up early and pray. There was at one point you'd wake up late at night and have to pace the floor seeking God's presence. At one point, nobody had to encourage you to come to church. You were the first one in the building and the last one to leave. Nobody had to tell you why we should give. You just wanted to do it because you knew that was a part of your contribution and you didn't want to be a consumer. You wanted to be a contributor and God is looking for contributors and not just consumers because he wants to, con he wants to consume the contributors with his fire. 
And so those who contribute experience the fire. Why? Because they understand I'm going to be deliberate in how I dedicate my life to God. I'm going to be deliberate in how I love my spouse. I'm going to be deliberate in how I use my money. I'm going to be deliberate in how I help build God's church and his community. I'm going to be deliberate. It's not going to be accidental. Some of us are waiting for accidental purpose to happen. And purpose don't happen accidentally. You bump into purpose when you are intentionally living God's way and his will. But it takes some people to dedicate some things deliberately. My children are dedicated to God. My marriage is dedicated to God. My finances are dedicated to God. My life is dedicated to God. My work, my job is dedicated to God. And since it's dedicated to God, that provides an opportunity to fall in those areas of my life. But the fire ain't going to fall in a place in my life that I don't build an altar to God in. Somebody shout, I'm building an altar. You got to build an altar. It's time to come out of complacency. It's time to stop being wavering by what the news is saying and what you should do and how you should believe. CNN don't determine what I believe. Fox News don't determine what I believe. The president don't determine what I believe. It's this book. It's the holy word of God. It is the unchanging truth. And it says what it says. And God don't have an email, so you can't get an email address and say, God, I don't like this part. No, it's either you live by it or you die by it. You will live by the sword or die by the sword and choose you this day which way you're going to live because now it's put up or shut up time. Ain't no wavering between, well, it's still sin, but we're going to do this. It's still it's still a sin, but we just ain't going to talk about it. We ain't going to talk about perversion. We ain't going to talk about all these all, all this stuff. We ain't going to talk about lying. And, we ain't gonna talk. And, and so we have to choose. Are we going to be people who stick to God's word? Are we going to allow the world system to water down the fire of his church? Somebody look at somebody and say, I'm, it's time to rebuild the altar. Tell them it's time to repair the altar. You got to be deliberate in your dedication. You got to be deliberate in it. Elijah repaired the Lord's altar, but watch this. He didn't just do repair any old kind of way, did he? No, no, no. It says he repaired the altar that was broken down. At one point, it was erected. At one point, Solomon offered sacrifices to God in this very place. But now, over time, God's people have become stagnant, and they've allowed pollution to come in to what they believe. And Elijah has to come back. See, there's always somebody in a generation who's fed up with broken down altars. And I believe there's some people under the sound of my voice, you're fed up with the broken down altars in your family. Even if you're the only one. Elijah was the only one standing on that mountain that day who believed in the Lord God of Israel. You know how intimidating that can be? When you're surrounded by people who have uh, the, the opposite opinion and you're the only one that believes it here's a question would you believe in what you say you believe in if you were the only one that believed it if you were the only one that believed that Jesus Christ is the son of God he came down to earth died on a cross and was buried in a tomb and was resurrected on the third day and after 50 days he, his Holy Spirit fell on, on 120 people in the upper room if you were the only one that believed that would you still believe it I'm telling you, church, there's coming a day where your actions better match your yes. Because you may feel like Elijah one day standing all alone and everybody is saying, conform, conform. Conform to this pattern. Let this slide. That's how flies end up in the oil. And it gets polluted and then it gets diluted. I hope you don't come to Hope Church for a success seminar, although I believe in success seminars and I believe that God wants you to live your best life and be successful. But whenever we gather and then we go, wherever we go in our weeks, 
you are responsible to carry the fire. You are a man or a woman of God enough to stand boldly in front of any and all opposition. No matter how many insults, no matter how many things are thrown your way that attack to conform you into a worldly system, that you are bold enough to stand and say, the Lord is God. You may try to intimidate me. You may try to insult me. Just stick around a little bit. You're about to see fire fall in a way. My God answers. And not only does he answer, he answers by fire. But carnage, it takes people who have a deliberate dedication. Who are bold enough and live with a conviction enough to say, I'm going to repair what's broken down. And Elijah takes 12 stones. He could have took a, more than 12. He could have took less than 12. But he takes 12. Why does he take 12? The scripture says it. It's because there are 12 tribes of Israel. But there's actually there's a, a beef going on. There's like 10 on one side and 2 on the other. At this particular point in history. And so as, watch this. But who's up there on the mountain with him? The people of Israel. Right? The people who are disunified, the people who are disjointed, the people who have, who have allowed another kind of worship to come in. And the Bible says he builds this altar with a foundation of 12 stones. In a point in time where there's disunity. He builds a foundation that reminds the people of who they're called to be. Because God ordained 12 tribes of Israel. And at this point in time, they're not living as 12 tribes are separated. And when Elijah takes these 12 stones, he does it purposefully. And he does it deliberately to show the people, this is who you're supposed to be. You're supposed to build your life on this foundation. Not on a stimulus check. Your life should be built upon my provision. Your life should be built upon who I say you are, not what a bathroom sign says you are. Y'all don't like that. Okay. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. Y'all, y'all, y'all just want cute, motivational speaking, but we have to call sin is sin. We love all people. Hear me. We love all people. I don't care what you look like, what your background is. You keep coming to this church. But also, no. We have to speak what the Word of God says. Sin is sin and sin is sin. And there might be some people signing off right now. There might be some people who say, this ain't a church for me. But we choose to believe what this word says. God's looking for some people to repair an altar. But it has to be a deliberate dedication. It has to be a foundation laid that's built on truth. Jesus said the true time is coming where where the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Truth, not opinion, not what your mama said. But what does truth say? Because this is the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. One thing I know about a sword, it cuts. It pierces, the Bible says. It pierces. That's why if I don't get this word in me, if I don't know this, then I'll fall for every deception. I'll fall for every scheme. And guess what? I won't be discerning of the times. There was a a group of people called the sons of Issachar in the Old Testament. And the Bible says they knew the times and the seasons of which Israel should do a thing. 
You know why? Because they had ears. They had ears to hear. They wasn't clogged up with what Instagram was saying. It wasn't clogged up with what the latest news report was saying. It was filled with the holy word of God. We need to get back to treating this book as holy and not just a suggestion. You want to see the fire fall? Stop treating this book as a suggestion and start looking at it as a commandment, as orders. Military people understand this because orders is orders is orders. And in the spirit, we are not in a democracy. We are in a kingdom. But us Americans have never lived with a, a king in power. So it's hard for us to understand sometimes what living for a king looks like. Because we got democracy, which, hey, I, great, wonderful. <laughs> but when God says something, it's not up for vote. Are you hearing me today? I just want you to hear my heart. It's not up for vote. It's not up for uh, uh, deliberation. It's not up for any kind of debate. It is up. To either decide, am I going to dedicate my life according to this, or am I going to choose to waver and live watered down? Hmm. I got some time left. You got to live with deliberate dedication. Y'all good? After he laid the foundation, what does the Bible say he did? He told, watch this. Woo. I can't wait to share this. He told everybody that was there. He said, fill up four, what, jars with what? Water. You'll catch it in a second. Fill up four water pots with water. And Josh, I can hear the murmurs and the opinions and the complaints of all the people on the mountain that day. Don't this brother know there's a drought? And he wants to get some water? He wants us to get water and do what with it? Waste it? He wants us to get the most valuable resource that we need right now. They've been in a drought for three years. It has not rained. And he says, fill up four jars full of the most valuable resource that we need right now. And I'm going to pour it on this altar. Take the most valuable asset that the land needs right now. Take, H to, take this water. Every, you, and everybody, as they're, as they're doing, I can just hear them. I can just hear them. I can't, why is he? This is a waste. Why would he waste this water on this altar? Why would he waste pouring this on that? There's a bloody bull on top of that altar. He wants to pour water on it? Elijah, why are you wasting this water? I could, I could cause my whole family to drink for a week with this water, and you want to pour it out on this? Elijah, this is a waste. Can't you use something else? Elijah, can't you use a substitute? Can you use a substitute to pour out on something authentic? Can you believe he's going to use this water? He's going to do it. We got any water? Yeah. And they found some water. So evidently, they had water. They were just choosing not to use it on an altar. Hmm. See, many times we confuse a lack of provision, not having provision, when really it's just a lack of priority. <laughs> oh my God, I got to park right here. 
It's a lack of provision, so they think, but it's really just a lack of priority because they had water. They had water. But the way that Elijah was using it, they saw it as waste. They saw it as wasteful. Hmm. Jesus, why are you letting this woman pour this expensive perfume on your feet? Don't you know we could have sold that? Why are you letting her waste that valuable thing on you? And you know who said that? Judas. Because Judas was in charge of the money. Which to me debunks the myth that Jesus was broke. Because if you got somebody carrying your money, now I'm not saying he was just, he went living lavishly, but when he says, when it says he became poor, it's not talking about material things. He left the extravagance of heaven to come down to a dusty earth. And he emptied himself of his heavenly position so he could walk on this earth and show you and I how to live. So Judas is carrying the money. And here comes this woman in the house anointing Jesus with something that's valuable and pouring it on his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. And guess who speaks up? The one who's robbing Jesus anyway because as the money keeper, it says he would help himself to the money box. So to the one who was being greedy, yes, it looked wasteful. Why are we spending all this money on all this? Why we got to do that? I don't, it don't, and it addresses the attitude, it don't take all that. Does it take all that? Does it take all that noise? Does it take all those songs? Does it take us bowing down? Does it take us giving of our life? Does it take us sacrificing our financial resources? Does it take all of that? And the answer is yes, but to some who see it as waste, Elijah says, this isn't waste, this is worship. And what some people see as a waste, God sees as worship. That's why worship looks wasteful to those who don't understand what's happening, that there's a transaction taking place, that I am not wasting anything because I serve a God who don't waste anything. He takes everything that is laid down, and he is able to use it for his glory. And so if it looks wasteful to somebody, it's worship to somebody else. So I wouldn't criticize someone's worship and how someone praises and how someone sacrifices because to them, that's worship to God. You might call it waste, but to me, it's worship. Elijah, you don't need to use water. Use something else. And he says, ah, baby, I got to use water because it's the most valuable thing. I need this water. You need this water. But guess what? Before you and I dabble in it and for you and I use this water, we're going to give it to God first. That's why tithing is so important. It says, God, yeah, I know I need this, but I'm going to honor you with what I have. I'm going to lay it on the altar and say, God, you oversee my money. You are my resource. I'm not going to trust in man's systems. Parents, that's why I give my children to God because God can only protect them from the seen and the unseen. He is the one that watches over them. He puts a hedge of angels around them. That's why you got to give them to God. Teach them in the ways that they should go. I know they might not understand it now, but when they are older, they shall not turn from it. Parents, mom, dad, I don't know why I'm saying this, moms and dads, you keep sowing seeds into that child. You think, and hey, don't, don't have a clue, who don't care, who don't want to talk about God, who don't want to know nothing about Jesus. You keep sowing seeds. I watched my parents sow seed into a hellion of a brother and watch him raise all kind of hell across this city, being drunk, in drugs, all over the place, lying, cheating, all kinds of stuff, out there getting high, being left in the prison down in Dublin, in the jail. And my dad 
said, hey, you're going to have to stay there because I love you too much to come get you. And there's some things that you're going to have to find out. Parents, believe me, I've seen it with my own two eyes as the cops carried my brother away and my parents still go into his bedroom and anoint his pillow with oil and say, he's still called, he's still chosen. I've seen them give away their whole paycheck in an offering as a seed to say, God, I'm sowing this offering by faith because we believe my son is coming home. It don't look like it now. It might not be living the way we want him to now. He might not be living for you, but we're going to give him to you because we don't know what else to do. Hallelujah. It's a deliberate dedication. It's a deliberate dedication. Jump to your feet. I'm done. It's a deliberate dedication. Elijah, we need that water. Yes, it takes all of that. It's not wasteful. It's worshipful. But then the next thing I got to do is I, after I address my divided devotion and I have deliberate dedication, I got to trust God for a divine demonstration. I got to trust God for a divine demonstration. Because God's the only one that can make fire fall. And you know it's from God when fire falls, because fire don't fall, it rises. That's why when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, it was resting on their heads. (laughs) That's the difference between a man-made fire and a God-made fire. Because when you make the fire, you're responsible. God makes the fire transformation takes place trust God I don't know who I'm talking to you need to trust God for a divine demonstration that as you repair the altar as you give it to him only he can make the fire fall and Elijah he didn't jump around Tasha he didn't leap he didn't cut himself he didn't Start shouting crazy. All he said was a few words. And he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, sometimes you got to remind yourself what he's done. And when he prayed, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he was saying, God, you did it for them. I need you to do it for me. Lord, you caused a pillar of fire to lead your children through through the wilderness. You cause a pillar of fire to warm your children at night in the desert. If you can cause that fire to fall, Lord, let it fall from me today. And he says, let it be known. See, he wasn't building the fire so he could get credit. He was building the fire so God could get the glory. Let it be known today. You are God. And I am your servant. And I have done all these things according to your word. And the Bible says that you said, let this people know that you are Lord and their hearts turn back to you again, which it tells us at one point it used to be turned towards God, but now it has been turned away because God is not a middle ground God. You're either all in or you ain't. The old saints used to say, he's either Lord of all or he ain't Lord at all. And the Bible says, the fire fell off one man's prayer, off one man's faith to build or repair an altar, to restore something, to to do what was necessary. Did it take all that? Maybe not, but Elijah saw it as an opportunity to rebuild a system in God's people that needed worship to return to it. And the Bible says, then the fire fell. It fell. That fire traveled from the heavens all the way past Jupiter. 
past Mars through the Milky Way. Said what's up to the moon and kept right on going until it touched down on Mount Carmel. Why am I saying that? Because the fire can find you wherever you're located. The fire can find you in loss. The fire can find you in sickness. The fire can find you in depression. The fire can find you. Somebody shout, the fire can find me. The fire can find me in loneliness. The fire can find me in isolation. The fire can find me in brokenness. The fire of God can always find you. And all the people, they fall on their faces. And what do they say? Together. They say in unity, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Can I tell you that when God's presence truly falls among a people, among a church, among a family, what my flesh wants is no longer important because I just want him. And these people probably went from looking at Elijah crazy because they thought he was wasting water and they wanted water to now water is no longer on their minds because they are experiencing the tangible Shekinah glory of God's presence right in front of them. And what their flesh wanted, they no longer wanted. Church, can I tell you, when you encounter the true presence of God and the fire of God hits your life, Life, you'll no longer want what you thought you needed and thought you wanted. Your flesh won't crave what you thought you wanted and God's presence will be the priority because if I can't have him, I don't want anything else. If he don't increase, I don't know what's going to happen. But God, I need you to come down, Father. Let your fire fall. Let it fall on my life. Let it fall in my family. Lord, I don't want to crave what I used to crave. I don't want what I used to want. All I want is you. That's all we want today. I promise I'm done. I promise I'm done. I'm sorry, I'm trying. I'm trying to close. I'm trying to land a plane, trying to land a plane. Here it is. If you really, because once the fire falls, you think the enemy's just going to sit there and say, all right, you just be on fire for God. Go be a witness. The last thing you got to do is you have to destroy the destructive. Some of you ain't going to like this part. If you're watching this, listen to me. You got to destroy the destructive. Watch this. Because after the fire fell and all the people were unified, Elijah says, get the prophets of Baal. Don't let them escape. Watch this. And he didn't kill them. He didn't destroy them where the fire fell. He went down the mountain and he handled it where their influence was. Are you hearing me? They had no influence on the mountaintop because God's presence was dominating. But it was when they came back down the mountain that the people had issues. And the prophets, who were the voice to the nation, were the ones responsible for the idolatrous living of Israel. And it was the prophets who were constantly keeping God's people watered down in their worship to God. So Elijah said, we ain't coming back up here again. Get the prophets of Baal. Get all those things who caused the fire to go out. Get the prophets of Baal, the ones that are responsible for constantly having the fire dwindle in God's people. And we're going to take them and we're going to go destroy those destructive things. Bring that habit down the mountain. 
That thing that's had influence over you. Bring that attitude. Bring that impure desire. Bring that unhealthy relationship. Bring that, and we're going to destroy everything that's caused that fire in you to dwindle because God is responsible to bring the fire, but we have to be responsible to remove what needs to be removed from our life. Oh, my God. If these prophets stay alive, God's people will be right back into idolatry and complacency. See, that's why you got to destroy that destructive thing. Because that's the thing that keeps opposing the work of God in your life. And here it is. I promise, I'm not, this is it. I've said that four times. Are you ready? If I say I want God to make the fire fall, but I run back to what causes the fire to go out, I don't want transformation. I just want excitement. Let me say that again because being we're, we're conditioned to come to church and check the box. I'm trying to get us to a level where every time we gather, we got to grab extinguishers because <laughs> it gets so fiery up in here. If I say I want the fire to fall, but I keep running back to what makes the fire go out, I don't want transformation. I just want excitement. That is the equivalent to someone addicted to drugs. Because you're satisfied with momentary fixes. A feel good moment. And not permanent change. So you make a decision to follow Jesus, but then the conversion process has to take place. We really appreciate you watching. Why don't you go ahead and click that share button and share it with a friend so they can enjoy it as well. If you want to find out more information about Hope Church, follow us on social media or go to our website. At our website, you can find out how to get involved, when our next baptisms are, and how you can give and support this ministry financially. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.